project. And so when we announced that we were going to just quickly sequence the human genome with a small team, it was met first with uh, incredulousness and then uh, hostility uh, mm -hmm. that I was stealing the thunder of this huge federal program. But uh, the right response, in my view, is the federal program should have adapted to the new technologies uh, and move forward quickly. All the people that were criticizing me now then have all adopted the techniques that we put forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what happens over and over again in the history of science. Uh, first new ideas are pretty severely attacked. Uh, and then there's sort of a neutral change and then the people accept it uh, and assume it was the right thing all along. So there was a, uh, a book written yeah. about this, uh, about the uh, nature of scientific revolutions. Uh, they so go against the grain of established thinking. But in your case, I wonder, the establishment has gotten so ponderous at this point. I wonder if the the breakthrough person has to be, and to some extent, someone like you who is a bit of an outsider. Would you agree that mm -hmm. that's true? You came to, to, the scientific, to a scientific education relatively late. Um, you were not the, you were a rebellious student. Yeah. You went to Vietnam. Um, you came back and fired up with, with zeal, got your PhD and, you know, on record time, yeah. and then when it forged ahead in a way, in an entrepreneurial way that's unusual, I think, for a scientist who would go ploddingly, perhaps that's the wrong word, but who would go through the established channels at the established points. Well, unfortunately, most scientists do that, but the ones that are really successful and make major breakthroughs and contributions to society, you have to be entrepreneurial today because our teams require such large uh, budgets. Mm -hmm. uh, just even for our effort to sequence the human genome the first time, uh, took a hundred million dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, the federal program was three billion. Uh, these are not small amounts by uh, any approach. And if you didn't have the resources, you could not. You, it didn't matter. You were you were. So when invisible. you say being entrepreneurial, I guess there are two ways of looking at it. You can be uh, absolutely aggressive about it, or perhaps you can be extremely ingratiating and work the system. Uh, in that way, uh, would you say there are two two methods? Well, the, the second yeah. method usually doesn't, doesn't work, work. <laughs> and, and it's, I think that's considered anti-entrepreneurial. Uh, yeah, I know it is anti-entrepreneurial, <laughs> but I wonder if it sometimes works. Yeah. People do it through greasing the wheels as opposed to, you know, opposing. It, very seldom. In fact, what successful scientists have to do is they either get uh, uh, their next grant funded for work that they've already done so they can use the money for the breakthrough so that you can sort of cheat the system a little mm -hmm. bit and that's what leading scientists do or you find alternate ways to support uh, the work. What I have a concern with is our government's afraid to fund new ideas because they're afraid that Congress will say money's being wasted if people fail. We fund things that are safe to fund and so for every scientist like me that found an alternate way to do his experiment how many thousands don't have that opportunity and what does that cost us as a country, as a nation, as we uh, struggle uh, to even have scientific thinking and scientific teaching in a country where the majority uh, doesn't even want to talk about evolution or have it taught in schools. I, I think we have to take this very seriously if the U.S. is going to remain competitive in the future. And do you foresee a change in the structure, or do you see things going more toward the private sector and the funding of, prog of ideas like yours through the private sector as opposed to the public? Well, th there's been a change over, uh, uh, certainly during my lifetime. Before World War II, uh, the government funded very little research. Mm -hmm. uh, it was all done by uh, private uh, organizations, philanthropic organizations and companies. Mm -hmm. Then after World War II, NIH was formed and uh, came to dominate funding in the medical area. Mm -hmm. uh, but now that's fallen off again and it provides less than 50% of the basic science funding. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, we have a large group of very successful entrepreneurs in this country. Uh, people like Bill Gates uh, with his uh, and his wife's foundation that is now funding three billion dollars worth of research a year. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a stunning number yeah. uh, for individuals. So. More and more, the leading edge of science is getting funded by corporations, uh, by private donations, and by organizations that don't have the same cumbersome structure as the government. Our government's very good at funding ideas once they're proven, mm -hmm. uh, but that's a problem. If you can't get a, a new idea out there to get it proven, uh, they get lost. 
And of course, once you had gotten underway, the race with the government was productive, I guess, for both sides. Maybe you'll disagree with that. But well, it, it, it helped move things uh, forward, certainly in the government side. We, you know, they, they had to, they were forced to finish. Uh, <laughs> what they might have dragged their feet maybe on. Maybe a for decade yeah. uh, ahead mm -hmm. of time. But I, I think the other thing that came out of it, uh, the general public r understands competition. Mm -hmm. And I think it brought the genome and genome science uh, to the public's attention. Uh, in a way that it might not have been before. So I'm trying to look back and find uh, positive attributes to the competition. You do name names in this book. See, I think this will be an incentive for people to go out and buy the book. You name names of people in the NIH and top scientists and so forth that in various ways were obstructionist to you or dishonest. And I mean, I don't know if that's too strong a term, but really dishonest in a way. And um, I wonder if you, uh, ha what kind of response you've gotten from these people or their colleagues. And if you would go back and, and amend any of this, or do you stand by everything you say? Well, in fact, it was one of the most disappointing things to me as coming up as a young, naive scientist, uh, thinking that science was truly the pursuit of truth about the universe around us. Mm -hmm. And that if you ask questions and you discovered that truth, uh, that that would be rewarded or you know, at least uh, sustained. Uh, most scientists aren't aware of the political aspects until they get embroiled in it and that how much of funding is determined by personality, by prejudice, mm -hmm. uh, by all kinds of different aspects. And uh, uh, so I've tried to be candid about those issues to mm -hmm. help teach others that, uh, you know, the Hollywood view of science isn't necessarily the real view. Uh, and I think it's important for the public to understand science. We're, we're now at a phase of our society where we're 100% dependent on science uh, to get us through this next phase. Mm. We're adding t billions of tons of carbon to the atmosphere. We can't keep doing that. Our population is growing from six to nine billion people. We don't have ways to feed or provide fresh water or fuel for them. Mm. So science is now not an option for people and understanding how it proceeds, how best to fund it. These are very important issues. Okay. Uh, by the way, to answer your question, uh, uh, there's not been a, a single person who's uh, disagreed or disputed uh, what the book really? says. Uh, in fact, quite the opposite. I've had lots of validation. People of, have come out of the woodwork. That's right, saying yeah. it, that's exactly uh, their experience as well. Um, you are also a devoted sailor. <laughs> and, that I uh, plead guilty to. Yes. yes. And throughout the book, at various junctures, you go off sailing. Often you, uh, there are various points where you buy a boat and you rig it up, is that what you call it? Mm -hmm. I'm not a sailor. Um, and then you fall, in, well, you fall in love with the boat and you get it ready and you take part in a race and it seems to be a very cathartic experience for you. And from there, you're able to go back to science. And I was wondering if, you know, do you see your life as this back and forth motion between the ocean and the laboratory? I think everybody has something that's a diversion uh, for them for their primary occupation. Uh, sailing for me is a unique experience. I get out on the ocean and my mind totally clears and uh, uh, there's been a lot of famous scientists that uh, recovered their brains through sailing, including Einstein. Uh, and it is very cathartic and uh, you, you have to focus totally on what you're doing, especially when you're crossing oceans or racing across oceans. Uh, and it, it was a key at various transition points. Uh, but you know, what you described, I described my sailing biography as well as my science biography. Yeah. And I think the nicest thing for me was when they came together, yeah. uh, we're sailing around the world, uh, which is something I always dreamed about doing. I combined it with science of characterizing the environment using DNA sequencing. And which is one of your latest projects. That's right. Yeah. So uh, a yeah. lot of people say that's, uh, that was my most clever discovery, was learning how to sail and do science at the to same time. To synthesize the that's two. Right. For some people, sailing would be a completely relaxing activity, but you like to race. So I think we're getting at the core of your competitive spirit, which carries over from the lab into your uh, leisure yeah. time. Yeah. Well, the argument is if there's two sailboats out in the water and they're going in the same direction, they're racing. Oh, I didn't know that. At least until one pulls ahead and then... Uh, <laughs> Maybe that's how you see it. Uh, right? Well, yeah. I, I definitely see it that yeah. way, but I, I think most sailors do as well, at least <laughs> until they're... Uh, one pulls way away or falls behind, and I've been in both positions. You know, it was a big decision to s decide to sail across the Atlantic Ocean. That was a 
uh, something I had to decide, could I really take the time off from what I was doing? So entering a race was a good way to force it yeah. and also force the discipline of having to sail the whole way. You couldn't use your motor or other right. things, so right. it, it made it a little bit more pure. Well, I guess with sailing as well as in your, in your scientific work, you have to work with a team. Absolutely. And that's something that comes through in your book. Good. Um, you're a team player, but you're also a competitor and an, a strong individualist. Do you ever find tension between those two in, in science? In, in fact, I think it's been the key to my success mm -hmm. and, and the key with hiring people. I try to hire the brightest people I can mm -hmm. uh, and then give them a chance to be individuals themselves and build their own teams. But all the work we did, particularly sequence the human genome, was a multidisciplinary effort from computer scientists, mathematicians, molecular biologists, uh, computer engineers, uh, robot engineers, a uh, wide range of people, and each one knew if they failed, the whole project failed. Mm -hmm. And so they all achieved more than any of us thought any of us were capable of, and, and it was probably the most exciting team ever in science. Hmm. So I guess you would say you're a good leader, as well as a good yeah, researcher and you like to work on a team, but I would think yeah. it's the leadership role as well that's fundamental here. I mean, fortunately, I've been able to inspire other people with big ideas mm -hmm. uh, that... But coordinating people and making them yes. feel important enough within a large project must be a hard thing to do. Actually, it's not so hard when you have great people to work with. Okay, uh, you, so you, you hire you, well. You, you, yeah. you, hiring is the best thing you can do. Okay. You, you know. Well, I wonder if you would end by giving us uh, some sense of what you would tell a young researcher, a young scientist, embarking uh, in some area, what, what kind of advice you would give as they, as they move forward? Well, the number one rule is to follow your own passion. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter in the future whether that's mathematics, whether it's uh, being great at computing, uh, writing uh, software, doing experiments in molecular biology. Uh, any and all these things come together. Engineering, we are combining all these skill sets and that's going to be key for the future. When you think about trying to make new fuels from biology, one of the key projects we're working on now, we have to solve the molecular biology of the cell, but we also have to have engineering that works on the scale of millions to billions of gallons. Mm -hmm. So we need creativeness at uh, every stage. So students just can't go wrong uh, unless they don't follow what they're really passionate about. Okay, so not so much following what they should do, but following what they feel they want to do. And Absolutely. What they believe in. I'd like to thank you, Craig Venter, for being here today. My pleasure. And I'd like to thank you for joining us at the Drexel interview.